I'm going to present to you today uh, the up, a very short snapshot of a report that was released last year and the updated results of what I'm working on now. What are the minerals required to phase out fossil fuels? Here's the report that was released last year. This study was to address certain uh, deficits in, da in data that I required to answer the mineral question. What I was to look at was the assessment of the extra capacity required of alternative energy electrical power systems to completely phase out fossil fuels. The, uh, the report followed this path of development. First I assembled what was actually physically done industrially by fossil fuels. And then, given that each energy system has an efficiency, what was the actual true scope of useful work? And if we had non-fossil fuel systems, what would they be? And if I assemble them in large enough numbers, how much electrical power will have to come off the grid to charge those uh, electric vehicle batteries and produce the needed hydrogen? Now, making the assumption that we will expand the existing energy mix from 2018 up to the new capacity, how many new non-fossil fuel power stations will be needed? In this report, we have the number of vehicles by class, the number of uh, and size of batteries, an understanding of when you'd use an electric vehicle and when you would use a hydrogen fuel cell, estimates of an electric and hydrogen rail transport system and maritime shipping fleet. Estimates to actually phase out fossil fuel applications like power generation. I examine the feasibility of expanding the nuclear power plant fleet. That's flagged as one of the solutions. I also looked at biofuels. Can we scale up biofuels to be useful? And plastics and fertilizers are also looked at. All of that is one place, in one place to answer a very thorny question. The calculation arc went something like this. What was the true scope of tasks to phase out uh, fossil fuels and replace the existing system as you see it now? When you look out the window, all those cars and trucks and rail, if we were to completely replace that system, what would it look like? So I modelled the existing system based on 2018 data. I looked at cars, trucks, rail, maritime shipping and aviation. I did it for the United States, Europe, China, and the fourth calculation, which I will show you today, was a global calculation. So four calculations were done in parallel, and a recent report has actually done this calculation for Finland. So that gave us the number and size of batteries and technical units, and so an estimate of the proportional mix was made. Now, to put this in context, in 2018, 84.5% of primary energy was still fossil fuel based. So most of the system hasn't been built yet. So I looked at the required grid expansion, like what will be required of us. Not when we'll get this done, but what will be done. And I also looked at the required power storage to manage intermittent supply, stationary buffer uh, power storage. That's the elephant in the room. It hasn't been done very well. If you couldn't be bothered reading the report, read this black square down the bottom here. Uh, the current plans are not large enough in scope. Uh, add to the task before us is much larger than current thinking allows for. The calculation went something like this. The current global fleet of vehicles in 2018 was 1.4 billion vehicles. That is a conservative estimate. The real number could be as high as 1.5. Those vehicles travelled uh, an estimated 16 trillion kilometres. Now, in 2020, less than 1% of the vehicle fleet was electric vehicle. Now, which means the majority of those vehicles have got to be replaced. Now, as they have not been manufactured yet, we can't recycle them. So those metal has to come from mining. Because I did uh, hydrogen electric vehicles in parallel, I was able to make some interesting comparisons. The electric vehicle requires a battery mass 3.2 times the equivalent hydrogen fuel cell tank. So what that means is, for the same energy storage, the hydrogen fuel cell had 3.2 times the range. However, to make that hydrogen, if we're not going to use gas, we need a 2.5 times the electricity. 
put those two together, all short range vehicles should be electric vehicles. Anything that has a, uh, requires a range of less than 100 kilometres, anything in a major city. Passenger cars, commercial vans, delivery trucks and buses. About 1.4 billion vehicles and they would travel 14 trillion kilometres in one year. To do that, we will need 65 terawatts of batteries. All other studies I have seen have units in gigawatt hours. I've got terawatt hours. They've badly misunderstood, uh, misunderstood the size of the fleet. All long range vehicles should be, uh, or heavy vehicles, should be hydrogen. So, all class 8 HCV semi trailers, all rail transport that is not electric already, and the entire maritime shipping fleet should all go to hydrogen. To do this, we will need 200 million tonnes of hydrogen annually. This is globally. So, there's the electric vehicle fleet. That number of cars travel those kilometres and we will need that power annually to charge those batteries. There's the electrical power generation, building, heating and steel manufacture. We will need that amount of power to replace that. This is in addition to what we already have. Here's the hydrogen economy. Those vehicles travel those distances and will need that amount of hydrogen. And to make that hydrogen, we will need that power. So I also looked at biofuels, and biofuels may be the most sensible way to keep the aviation industry in the air. It could be the only way to keep the plastics industry operational as well through bioplastics. We will need biofuels and biomass in some form, but it's a serious question of how far can we go with that and still be sustainable. So what is required here is a sustainability audit around the, the, these limitations being presented here. And that is a handoff and a trade-off between what is economic and what is economic and what is environmentally biodiversely sustainable. All existing studies are either one or the other. We actually need a study that's both. Let's put the power together. We need 3,700 terawatt hours a year, in addition to what we already have now. And that'll require about 220 thousand new non-fossil fuel power stations of average size. Put this in context, the existing power fleet is only 46,000. The difference between those two numbers is fossil fuels, oil, gas and coal are much more effective and carry much more energy calorifically than non-fossil non fuel systems. The energy return on energy invested on non-fossil fuel systems may not be strong enough to replace fossil fuels. If we then did the energy split in 2018 and it just expanded up to the new capacity, this is the number of stations that we will require. This is not practical. Uh, the IEA has actually since released a study of what they think the energy split will be and I'm currently doing a calculation around those new numbers. Uh, we will not be able to expand hydropower, for example, to that uh, capacity. Wind and solar are highly intermittent. We cannot run either without some sort of buffer. At the moment, the gas industry is that buffer. We remove gas. We've got to have variability to meet supply and demand to come into balance some other way. At the moment, the European Commission believes they will use stationary uh, battery uh, stations. You can use flywheels. You can use molten salt. But in terms of application, batteries are much nicer to use. So I picked a very conservative four weeks capacity for just wind and solar, just wind and solar, to get us through winter. In the literature, that number can be as high as 12 weeks for the whole system. So at that very conservative level, we need 574 terawatt hours of battery capacity in the global system. That is almost 10 times what the electric vehicles will require. This is the elephant in the room and it has not been looked at properly. Here are the numbers uh, shown graphically. The column on the left is what we did in um, 2018 in terms of power generation. There's the existing system that, that we can still use. That's what we need to phase out, oil, gas and coal. And the green column on the right is what we need to bring in. So we are discussing creating a system much larger than the existing system using very expensive and, uh, uh, energy to do so. That is the power we generated in, in 2018. So here are the tasks. Charge the batteries, make the hydrogen for the hydrogen fuel cells, phase out oil, gas and coal power generation, and building heating, and the sliver along the top is to replace coal-fired steel manufacture. 
So this is the task. We need to generate that amount of power. How are we going to do it? When I was talking to the IEA, they verbally said they saw the future to be wind and solar. All new capacity is going to come from wind and solar. The new report they've just released, it's not quite as simple as that, but this is not bad. So, but if we were to do that, if we were to hit those targets, it'll be 30% solar, 70% wind. That's the rough approximate they think is going to happen. We need 342,000 average size solar farms to do that. And we'll need 3.3 million wind turbines. And that's the power buffer. And the power buffer has not been part of the calculations at the moment. So the report that's actually come out recently has been uh, very useful. They've actually started to report the actual metals per um, kilograms per megawatt in each of these systems. So we have the number of technological units, and now we have the ability to actually pull apart what will be required metal-wise. They also have released uh, what's in each battery chemistry. And OK, these are crude estimates, but that's all I need to make this work. The same report has made some estimates in the year 2040, what is the market share for the um, battery chemistries that's going to be in batteries? in uh, electric vehicles, both light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. That fits very nicely with my study. We also have an estimate in 2040 of what the market share will be for the uh, stationary storage. So we project these market proportions up against the chemistries that we now have and pull apart the metals that we need and project that against the number of units that we now know we will have to use. And this answers the question which actually came from Pekanumi. We're having a cup of coffee in 2018. He casually asked this question, how much metal will be needed to phase out fossil fuels? And hilarity ensued, and here we are. So the electric vehicles, their batteries, the hydrogen fuel cells, which need platinum, all the wind turbines, the solar panels, and the battery storage, uh, buffer storage. Now to remember, this is to replace the existing system. So we're talking about one generation of units only. Remember, 10 years later, we do it all again, or 20 years later in, in the case of some units. And this is what we need. You often hear this, that production will just be a function of market forces. I'm from the Australian mining industry and they live by this. This is what we need. Now I picked, this is not all the metals. This is some of the metals which I believe will be a problem. You may notice copper is at the top. You also may notice that what we need is the first column and the units are in million tonnes. The middle column is what we produced in 2019. Now 2019 was the last year before uh, the COVID quarantine lockdowns, so it's the last sen sensible year of data for some time. And the years of production is how many years we will require at existing levels to hit those targets. Now we think we're going to do this. So the European Commission has committed to get 30% of this job done by 20, 2030, that's eight years away. So then the obvious question is, well, obviously we just open more mines. We've got plenty of reserves. So uh, let's look at uh, global uh, reserves. And as you can see here in this middle column, that's 2019 stated reserves, and the percentage uh, is quite low. At this point, it might occur to you all that this is not a very good plan and we should make a better one. For example, make batteries out of something else. We insist on lithium-ion battery chemistries. We could make batteries out of zinc or fluoride or sodium. We need, we, it's, it's not an instead of, we need them all and we need them now. The job for GDK, just explore for more. This is simple, right? For every thousand deposits we discover, only one or two become mines. And the time to take a deposit that's been discovered all the way out to a producing mine is about 20 years. And for every 10 producing mines, two or three will go under because they are not economically viable. And in closing, this is what the World Economic Forum released in 2019, which everyone is using since then. The column on the left is the amount of batteries that they think will be in the market by 2030, assuming 30% of the global vehicle fleet is electric vehicle. And they think that only is going to be 2,623 gigawatt hours of batteries. 
My numbers projected to the same 30% is 19,556 gigawatt hours. Our current policy leaders have badly misunderstood and underestimated the nature of the task in front of us. Conclusions. Well, we need a lot of additional power, much more than, 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 than we think. Now, if we use the same energy mix as 2018, that translates to 220,000 new power plants. The new numbers that are coming on board, that, that is actually a conservative estimate. The number's closer to 270,000. So electrical power generated from solar and wind is highly intermittent, and it can change from hour to hour, but also is, uh, the wind patterns in winter are different to the wind patterns in summer, as is the sun radiant content. We need a power buffer storage. And using a very conservative four week power capacity just for solar and wind, we will need 574 terawatt hours. So the total mass of lithium ion batteries to phase out fossil fuels across the chemistries is around 2.8 billion tonnes. That's across all, all the chemistries I showed you before. They all use lithium, they all use nickel, they all use cobalt, or most of them do. Current thinking has seriously underestimated the scale of what's in front of us. Nuclear is vital to keep industry going and we will need it in a larger capacity than what it is, but it cannot be the magic bullet to supp uh, supplant everything. Biofuels also will be needed in a larger capacity than what we do now, but it cannot be scaled up to replace petroleum. Battery chemistries other than lithium ion should be developed in parallel and immediately to develop the value chain around all of them. They will have different mineral resources required. And what is implied from that is we're about to change our relationship with both energy and minerals and natural resources in general. At the moment, our society is driven by money and numbers on the screen, it will become about raw materials. There's a projected mineral shortage to supply raw materials both for battery manufacture, but also for wind turbines and solar panels. 2018 production rates, sorry, 2019 production rates are not even close to being appropriate, and the current mineral reserves are also not large enough to deliver the needed volumes. Metals of all kinds are about to become much more valuable. An evolution of the industrial ecosystem is highly likely, and I would propose that one of the outcomes of this is that um, there will be a mining frontier opened in Europe, and Europe will have to mine once again and we'll have to be a nation that sources our own raw materials because each region will have to become more self-sufficient. We cannot depend on the existing system for much longer. There is a coming renaissance for the exploration and mining of minerals, and the implication of that is our raw materials in wastes will become much more valuable across all fronts in all sectors. Kiitos.